It's a, indeed, you have called each one of us, transferred each one of us into your, the kingdom of your beloved son, into the kingdom of light, placed us in particular places amongst particular people to be a blessing there, to share truth and love and grace. and placed each one of us in a community where we might encourage one another to do the same. Help us in this time, Lord, to see how we might do that, how we might encourage one another more and more day by day. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've um, been thinking about the implications, really, of Jesus' invitation to join um, with him in the restoration of all things, of doing what we can um, to make his little bit of the world, or his, our bit of the world, as much like he would like it to be before he returns to complete his work. His kingdom come, his will be done. I've suggested a, a framework for cultural change, and we've looked at uh, a number of examples of uh, one degree shifts that uh, church communities have used fruitfully along their particular journeys. Um, in a moment, I'm going to reflect, a bit, spend a bit of time reflecting on um, practical things that we can do around these four drivers of change that I mentioned before, Sunday gathering, preaching, and so on. Before I do, I want to say just a word or two about the implications for, for readers, for clergy, for church staff of, of this kind of uh, focus. I think, um, it's probably safe to say that pretty much all of you are, are busy and maybe busier than, than you were before and certainly working in um, rather more trying circumstances. Um, but as I suggested overall, this, this, this approach doesn't seem to require more time or extra staff or so on. But I do think it does require a shift in, in consciousness, a shift in, um, if you like, the way that we see people and a broadening often, but not always, of our actual knowledge of people's wider, wider lives. And this will actually be quite hard to do. Um, our church facing team at LICC are all pastors, are all involved with uh, churches now or have been uh, church leaders themselves. And um, here's, how, here's where they think time for church leaders goes with people. So here, people in the church is a bell curve and here I'll say 20% of people in pain, 20% of people in the leadership and the rest of the people. Now there may be, you may have more people um, who are in need in your particular community than that or you may have more people in leadership as a percentage of the church um, but that's what the bell curve looks like. Then, then, then we ask where does the time go? And if you look at the bell curve of where time goes, then the time tends to go primarily to people in pain, We've got to deal with that, primarily to people in leadership, people that actually we, we rely on uh, to do things, um, but everyone else tends to get very little time. And the challenge of that is that it can actually give quite a distorted view of what's in fact going on in a congregation or even in an area, because actually the all most of our time is spent with particular people with particular kinds of needs or encouraging people to do things we want done. So what is life like for the majority of people out there? As, uh, as one of our guys, uh, Ken Benjamin, uh, the former president of the Baptist Together put it, no one phones you up to let you know that they're having an average day. Hi, Becca, everything's fine. Just having an average day. Just thought you'd like to know. But it's usually in the average day that opportunities for mission come. So it becomes actually quite important in a way to understand people's average day. And what we found is that one of the best ways to do that, not surprisingly, is to go and see. And there is one uh, particular, particularly effective way to do that. And this is actually the skimmed milk, if you remember the analogy for church leaders. Um, this one habit we've been told by church leaders who do it, obviously not by the ones who don't, is the one thing that has uh, most changed and most energized their ministries. And I wonder if you were to think of one thing that might, might do that for you, what would it be? 
Well, I, I don't know how many of you were brought up on Baxter, but Baxter used to talk about visiting and uh, there's no, no real secret to that. Um, what we mean is go visit someone in the context um, where they see their ministry is. So it could be the supermarket as it was with Thelma. It could be um, the hairdressing salon for just five minutes. It could be it could be somebody's bowls club or their tennis club. It could be, it doesn't really matter what it is, but where is it they are? Remember um, one guy, um, um, Peter, uh, turned up wearing a, a dog collar to somebody's office. Um, usually it's quite a good idea if you are going to visit someone on their, in their everyday context to check how they might want you to dress. Anyway, there he is in this uh, office and uh, his, um, his parishioner and executive says to the vicar, uh, Peter, they don't know I'm a Christian. So Peter says, so, so how are we going to play that? And the other guy says, well, I guess they're going to find out today, aren't they? <laughs> um, and then every day for the following week, couple of weeks, people were coming up to him, this guy asking him who was that and why he was here. And of course, one of the things you can say that's so very compelling for, for, for the person who's in that context is, oh, that was my vicar. He's interested in what I do or she's interested in what I do. And that's actually already quite an interesting testimony, never mind anything else that might come out of it. Now, there are incumbents who have made it mandatory for their curates. I understand there are some newbie curates on the call today, uh, made it mandatory for their curates to go and visit someone on, on what we call their front line every week. Now, that seems like quite a tall order, but it's probably possible once a month. And it could be a school day. It could be a golf club, as I say. It could be anywhere. It could be somebody at home caring for someone. But the point about these things is to get a sense of the dynamics of the place. And the other thing is that when you are there, you hear different things and you have a different con conversation than you would if you were uh, chatting them over Zoom or chatting them over the phone or whatever it might be, because you're there. Now, I do want to tell you that um, most people do not want to do this. <laughs> um, and what happened in the London diocese is, um, I don't know who forced them to do it, but all the bishops had to do it. And as I recall, none of them wanted to do it, but they felt that they had to do it, you know, to, to, to be a good model. And it, it was quite amazing what happened. It, you know, they'd go to see two or three people over a month or whatever, and it, it featured in their sermons, it changed their preaching, it changed them. They just saw things differently. Um, changed their consciousness. And God often has something to say, just as he had something to say to Jeremiah when he went down to the potter's studio. What do you see when you go there? And again, it could be anything. So now let's uh, just turn to, to Sunday and take any service. And uh, one of the things I think in the Anglican tradition is, as it relates to um, setting God's people free or enabling for everyday faith, um, Actually, so many of the words are already there. They've just tended to be understood in a narrower way than perhaps was originally tended. As we saw with go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Depends what you understand by that. If you understand go and love and serve the Lord at the school gate, in your home, um, at the job center, as well as in um, serving in the church, well, the liturgy helps you. Similarly, the Lord be with you, um, as was pointed out. Boaz says it, where does he say it? In a field to his workers on an ordinary day. What's he wearing? Ordinary work clothes. Who's there? His workers. The first time we hear that phrase is not within the church building. And yet for so many people, it's been associated with that. And again, it's, the same happens when we think, think about the implications of words that you might, you might say over bread and wine. The Eucharist is not celebrated with grain and grapes. It's celebrated with bread and wine, bread made with human hands. As the words go, grain that was milled, water that was added, yeast that was kneaded in, ovens that were fired up, dough that was inserted, allowed to rise, taken out, brought. God taking something humans have worked on and transforming it for our blessing. So, we have all these opportunities and you, similarly, you, you can tell the, the culture of church by its prayer diary. 
Um, prayer diaries are always very interesting things. For where your prayer is, there your heart is. Remember one teacher saying to me uh, these words, I spend an hour in, uh, a week teaching Sunday school and they haul me up to the front of the church to, to pray for me. Uh, the rest of the week I'm a full-time teacher and the church has never prayed for me. And of course, um, nobody is saying to that teacher, your work at school doesn't matter. No one is saying that. But the kind of implication is if we are vocal here and silent there, is that in fact, we think one of them is more important than the other. And of course, they're both important. So some things um, are very eloquent because we don't do them. So there's lots of material on this. So obviously lots of churches have some form of intercession and there's nothing to stop us, including a different sector of society every month or a different area of work every week. You know, often intercessions include the sick and the dying and the queen and the national government, but rarely the pressures that people face in work at different times of the year. Fishermen during periods of inclement weather, accountants in spring, farmers at harvest, teachers in report seasons, social services over Christmas, sheep farmers in February, pub owners all the time, non-essential retailers in the pandemic, kids going back to school, and so on. And I think one of the things here is you don't have to have any kids in your church to be praying for kids to go back to school. You don't have to have any workers to be praying for people in work or out of it because you have kids in your town and you have workers in your town. And if you have an older congregation, then what's, what are, who's on their heart? <laughs> their kids and their grandkids. And it'd be great for grandkids who can, and your research says, can be hugely, hugely influential on children's lives. It's great for a grandparent to be able to say, to say to their grandchild, you know, we prayed for you in church today. And the similar thing happens with the offering. Just half a sentence, you know, we bring these gifts of money often. Well, where does it come from? It comes from a pension that somebody's worked from, it may come from uh, an unemployment a UB40 form, unemployment benefit form, it may come from wages, but it's an obvious opportunity to give thanks for the ways in which money has been provided for people. And I think within the Anglican tradition, you know, there's just tremendous opportunities in the church year, which in Britain we have, because it was brought, brought about, tracks effectively with the economic year. And one, one of my very favourites, it's not a favourite very many people I have to say, is Plough Sunday. And I've got very reasons for loving, loving Plough Sunday. This is a plough in a church. It doesn't, in fact, matter whether you are a farming community or not. It seems to me this is an opportunity at the beginning of the year to bless people's purposeful activity of God, wherever that might be, however they, they contribute to the flourishing of their family or their community, whether they're a house husband or a housewife or they're running a business or a farm or whatever it might be. Um, it's such a good idea, Plough Sunday, that a Baptist church I know uses Plough Sunday every year as the day on which they commission the whole congregation to their ministries wherever God has called them beyond the church. So last year I was, I was there and there was a plough, the plough that you can see on your screen at the front of the church. But people had also brought objects into the church that represented why they spent their time during the week out there every day. And uh, they put them on, as you can see, uh, between two ladders on a couple of pieces of wood. And there they were. So there's a pair of Nordic walking sticks because one person was part of a Nordic walking club. And that was the community they were trying to bless. There was a coffee cup in the shape of a camera lens because this man was part of a camera club. There was a pair of football boots from a 12 year old because that was the particular group, his football team that he was concerned that there was a set of new Christians against poverty brochures because somebody wanted those to be picked out so she could recruit more people to help. There was a set of van keys from, from a guy who was a man with a van. There was a memory stick and various bits of office paraphernalia. There was a stethoscope and a very big pile of school marking, all kinds of stuff. And then the minister led the congregation in a prayer, which they had on a piece of paper, commissioning them to their ministry. And you can imagine what that does to people. A sense of where, look where we all are, apart from anything else. Look how in how, in how many ways we penetrate this community. Oof. And look how we can encourage one another. And I think you can see this um, in the other feast days, you know, Plough Sunday, there's Rogation Sunday and so on. 
you may not have many fields to bless. I'm sure some of you have some fields to bless in Cornwall um, as, as farmers prepare to sow the seed. But, you know, there's lots going on within parish bounds and there's businesses and tradespeople and drivers and cleaners whose work to provide themselves, particularly now, could do with a blessing. I mean, praying for the regeneration of Cornish enterprise is a good prayer. And uh, I know I was been on the chat with, with, with one of you about how they'd um, been blessing local businesses. Uh, recently, I was thinking about chalking. I, I've never thought about chalking before. I, I hadn't been in a, in a church that did, did that, but I, somebody mentioned it to me, and, I, you know, and obviously you all know what it is. But I was thinking, well, what an incredible opportunity that could be, either to put a little notice on my own front door and the postman asked me about it or somebody asked me about it, or maybe to go into a local shop uh, with, a can with two candles and say, you know, our church... Um, is praying for local businesses on Epiphany and we wondered how we might pray for your business. I'd like to leave you a candle and we're going to light a candle for you and pray for you as a community. I have no idea whether that's even practical, but I'm going to give it a go. Um, similarly, harvest offers obvious opportunities, particularly again if what is brought into the church is not just the fruit of farmers' labours, but symbols of the fruit of the labour of the people in your congregation. A mop, for example. And so it goes on. So what I'm trying to suggest here, and candle mass, you know, is a, an opportunity to think about light and shade between of, of the experience that people have in the world, which is which is often difficult. So again, I, you know, none of those may be significant to you. What I'm really trying to say is, I, I think within the Anglican tradition there is such richness in what you already have. It's only a question really of of illuminating it for people if you haven't already done that. I'm sure there's loads of ideas here that might appear on the chat uh, that you've already had and so on. So, and if you are interested in particularly in, in the worship field, then there's um, quite a lot of work done by Sam and Sarah Hargreaves on whole life worship. There's a book and a whole resource suite that you can uh, have a look at. And you can find that on the licc.org.uk website. So I'd like to say a little bit about preaching. Um, um, again, this is something that we, you, we have to do. We, we do it anyway. So the question is, how are we reading the text? Are we reading the text through a whole life lens or, if you like, through a neighbourhood domestic community lens? Well, over the last few years, we've been uh, working with um, experienced preachers to work out what, what might help, what helps people make richer connections between the text and the everyday lives of people. And the first encouraging thing to say is that uh, the key is not to suddenly embark on a whole series of topical sermons on this, that and the other. I mean, you absolutely exhaust yourself if we go down that route, though in some areas it's probably necessary to, to take some topics and, and give them a good go. See, the challenge we have is not that the Bible is not a whole life document. It is a, it is a text concerned with everyday life. The problem is that on the whole, that is not how it has been commented on by scholars or taught in theological colleges or modeled by the preachers who preached to us when we were younger Christians. In other words, there's a culture around preaching which tends to privilege certain bits of the Bible, certain bits of passages and certain applications. I remember, you know, this, when, when this particular thing struck me, maybe completely obvious to you, I remember reading Psalm 144 verse one uh, once, and praise be to the Lord my God who trains my fingers for war, no, sorry, my hands for my fingers for battle. And I remember this first just hit me. I mean, it's completely obvious at one level that David is not some singer songwriter with a rainbow guitar strap pouring out his emotions. He is a soldier, he is a commander, he is a general. For him, words like shield, fortress, sword are not mere metaphors. He knows what a sword crashing against the shield sounds like. He knows what it feels like down his arm and into his shoulder. And all the Davidic Psalms take on a much sharper edge when we recognize this. There are 41 Psalms in the first book of Psalms. David wrote 37 of them. And 27 of those mention enemies. And again, 
those enemies are not metaphorical. They are, for the most part, trying to kill it. And in fact, it, out of the 75 Psalms attributed to David, at least 53, by my count, have him in a situation where he's mentioning a situation where he has enemies, foes, people portraying him, and so on. In other words, a big chunk of the Psalter, over a third of the Psalter, is written out of a context of having a very pressured and often toxic work situation. Now, most of the commentators flatten this out. They move too quickly from the particular that's in the psalm to the more generalized connections these psalms do have and do minister to people through the whole range of emotions that, that David expresses and that we often feel ourselves. So if you take Psalm 144, it's David looking back on his career and, you know, did God train his hands for war and his fingers for battle? Well, yes, we, we see him doing that even before he's been trained as a soldier because he's able to take out Goliath using slings, which are still sadly still used today in a variety of ways. So the application question might be, how have I seen God's, how have I seen God's hand in training me for the daily work he has given me to do? And then when you go through these Psalms, you see David again, again, talking about specific things. With your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. Well, there's nothing more dangerous than scaling a wall, since at any given moment, you only have one hand to defend yourself. And when you get to the top, you're extremely vulnerable. How does God help us in the most challenging things that we face in our day? Now, we know, and um, 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 that most Christians don't have a robust understanding, biblical understanding of purpose and significance of their, of their daily activity, whether they're paid or, or not paid for it. And you might ask yourself, why, how is it that that could be the case, that somehow we've not set before people the imaginative possibilities of how people can praise God in and through their work at home or wherever it is, the purposeful activity that orders the world around them, provides for their needs and the needs of others. How can it be? Well, it's not that the Bible doesn't have a great deal to say about it. There's a lot in the Bible that's directly about work. There's a lot of Bible that's set at work and there's a lot of Bible that applies to work. So from, you know, I'm not gonna spend long on this, but you know, it is kind of in the beginning, we've got God doing stuff, creating in Genesis 2, he, what does he do? He gives human beings work. In Genesis 3, we see the implications of human rebellion on work. In Genesis 4, we've got Cain and Abel both working and both bringing offerings, but it seems in different ways. In Genesis 5, we've got the theme of work in the first big construction project, big boat, specifically carried out in obedience to God's detailed command. Then you've got big tower work, specifically carried out in disobedience to God's command. You've got the theme of work in Joseph and Moses and, the judge and Jethro, the first management consultant, advising Moses on how to restructure the judiciary. It's in Leviticus and Deuteronomy instructions. It's in the exploration of Deborah, one of the most outstanding leaders, never criticized, and in the other judges. It's in Joshua and Kings, if we've seen it in Ruth, and, it's, and, in, and in Boaz, and it's in the Psalms. And you'll find it in Proverbs, which ends with what? With this incredible portrait of the wife of noble character, where the focus is very, very much on how the wise woman does her daily work. A woman who displays such a formidable range of domestic, managerial and commercial skills that you, you could only match it by genetically splicing together Nigella Lawson, Karen Brady and Angela Merkel. And if you did genetically splice together those three women, this is what you'd get. Which is, so I suggest we be very careful what we pray for. Um, so in work is, you know, how do we nurture this imagination for the everyday? And it is interesting to me that the apotheosis, the zenith of biblical wisdom is a woman working in and from the home. That is the zenith of biblical wisdom. That is Proverbs 31 lived out in the Old Testament. And it's in Ecclesiastes and Prophets and Esther and Daniel and so on, it goes on and on, Gospels and Colossians. So, so there's an issue about what we see and what we don't see. And you say, well, my people don't, a lot of my people don't work, but they do, they, they have daily activities. 
which they don't think are significant to work even if they're retired. And it also depends, I think, um, on, on who we think we're praying to. And, uh, and, and who are they and where are they in their world? So let me tell you this story. This story about a woman called Isabel. Isabel's about 60 years old when this happens. And she's at this church in Gateshead. And uh, um, they're having uh, a meeting about in the church uh, with one of our folk. And they're talking about front lines, so where they are and so on. And where do you minister during the week? And they're going around with this small group of people. There's one you know, set up in groups, they're going around a small group of people. And it gets to Isabel. And uh, it's one of those slightly embarrassing moments when there's someone in a group who, who doesn't, doesn't seem to sort of get it, doesn't think that, you know, this is for them. And uh, she says, I don't think I've got a front line. I, I don't think I've got a place where I minister. And uh, so the facilitator, Neil Hudson, he says, so Isabel, tell us, tell us, tell us about, a bit about your life. She said, well, I love the church. I do quite a bit in the church. I really love serving in the church and helping out there. And I look after my husband and take care of stuff here and so on. And love seeing my grandchildren. Well, tell us about your grandchildren. Well, you know, I see quite a bit of them really. And uh, one of them, you know, she, she comes around for Sunday lunch, uh, probably, uh, you know, three, three times a month. And, um, you know, interesting, she always asks me about the sermon, so, so I tell her. And then um, something inspired my colleague Neil to ask her this question, how old is your granddaughter? And Isabel said, she's 23. And suddenly the room changed. She's 23, she's emerging generation, she's the, the people that we can't reach. Uh, you know, that the church finds so difficult to get to and, and connect to. Do you mean to say that you are talking about um, the things of God, talking about the sermon that the vicar has preached three times a week with your granddaughter? Wow, fantastic. We'd better pray for you. Isn't that amazing? Let's pray for you. So they start praying for her and the vicar is sitting there and the vicar is thinking, which is easy to think, I thought I was praying to people over 55. And he was, but he wasn't. He's praying for people over 55 who've got relationships with people in their 30s and 40s and relationships with people in their teens and their 20s. So suddenly his preaching totally changed. He's thinking not only how can I say this in a way that helps people in this congregation who are all over 55 or mostly over 55, but how can I say it in a way that also enables them to offer something to the people that they connect to naturally? So in that one question, how old is your granddaughter? Something changed. Um, Isabel changed, her family changed, the group changed, the vicar changed and the vicar's preaching changed. Interestingly, three months later, because it was a church we were working with over three years, um, Neil went back and uh, Isabel said, uh, well, I'm cooking on gas now. My, my daughter's coming to church as well. And, you know, she was, she was suddenly alive, of course. So, again, this is kind of obvious. But the moment we see, see the people differently in front of us as people who've got a rich life out there and we have a sense of what that is, then it shifts how we preach and it shifts what we might see and how we might apply the text. So just a few more little things. Um, why small groups really matter? Not every, every church has a small group, but um, many do, don't, don't, don't we, at uh, Advent? And when I was in church in Northwood, we, we, had, uh, we had Advent groups and Lent groups, but no, no ongoing small groups. But interestingly, in, the, in, in research we've done, we've found again and again, independent of the stream of the church, that small groups are often the key to sustaining everyday faith in individuals and in a congregation. I say can be the key because it is very easy for small groups to become very inwardly focused, to not be concerned about issues beyond the church, the domestic and the neighborhood. 
And the reason they're very important is because, precisely because lots of Christians right now don't think they have a mission field, if you like, or an area of ministry beyond the church that's significant to God, because um, they don't necessarily already think they're being fruitful in a meaningful way. They often need other people to help them see it. And uh, I think I may have said this, but you know, I have probably, I don't know, almost everywhere I go, I collect stories. And usually the reason we collect so many stories that people haven't heard is because by telling stories, people realize they've got one. And, you know, a lot of our material is just full of them and you can see it. And we found the importance of the community helping one another to see it. When we did research on, um, on this, this material, the fruitfulness material, and the point really is the principle that comes from this research, not, not the particular value of this material itself. So we got feedback and we got very strange feedback on this material that we've not had from anything before. You know, some things are good and some things are excellent, but we got people and church leaders and group leaders saying, this changed the culture of our church. Um, we've never had feedback like this on, on anything we've done before and so on and so forth. And we began to wonder why, because at one level, it's quite simple. It's, it's got a bit of Bible study. It's got a bit of presenting. It's got some questions. It's got some a story every time. It's not, it's not like, oh my goodness, an amazing piece of film or anything. And that the framework, the six M's is liberating, but it definitely isn't planet Earth. And it's certainly not the Lord of the Rings. And then we realized what it was, what it was doing that we didn't see. The reason why it changed the culture, which is what we're talking about today, how can we change the culture of a community? Was because for eight weeks, the people in those groups got to talk about an area of their lives that they had very rarely talked to each other about before. And in that area, they were the expert. It's not like in some groups, there's the person who does, you know, they're the Bible person, or they lead the worship, or they do this, or they're the great prayer. They're the expert. On the school gate, Ali Martin is the expert. It's her school gate. We don't know any of the people. In the charity shop, Jim is the expert. In the tennis club, John, who once he realized it was a front line, invited, had two, two groups of people at the church quiz night from the tennis club, had two teams from the tennis club coming along and 25 people from the tennis club came, came to the, uh, the Christmas service. Well, things change. But the thing was, they got to learn about these things from each other. So by the end of eight weeks, they knew so much more about each other than they did before. In other words, their relationship had grown. The scope of their relationship had grown. They knew that Jim had been in the tennis club for 25 years and he got to the final of the singles five times and never won. They knew the name of Joan's boss. They knew about the people in the bowls club and how Jane had worked at the charity shop. Jane, who works at the charity, always kept the dinosaur figures for her sixth, grand, sixth grandchild, Joe, Zoe, who loved dinosaur figures. They, they knew that Kurt was really good at resolving conflict in his team. He's, he's a policeman and he actually works at number 10 and he's really good at solving conflict. And Kurt realized, oh my goodness, I've realized I am helping to um, generate forgiveness amongst the people with guns protecting the prime minister at number 10. Um, modeling his way to give the people number 10. He never thought about it before. And so on it goes on. They, they knew about Ian, etc., etc., etc. Their relationship was deeper. So potentially at the end of the course, they had broadened the scope of the conversations, deepened the quality of the relationships to embrace people's everyday lives. That's the point, to embrace people's everyday lives. They'd immersed in it. And once you know those things about people, you can't forget it. Can't forget it. You can't go back. That was the thing. So it doesn't actually matter how you do it. I'm not saying, you know, get this resource and all will be well. That's not my point. My point is that's how it happens. People coming together, helping one another see how they're already ministering and how they might and learning about one another in a way that can't go back.
no one in Isabel's group knew before that question that her granddaughter came to see her three times a month and talked about the sermon. And uh, finally, um, for this whole life personal prayer. And again, uh, I'm sure this, this, this in a sense again is obvious, but sometimes research really helps to helps us to see why the obvious is important. Um, we, we've been working with the Elim denomination for quite a long time and they commissioned us to find out how their healthy churches were doing in terms of whole life disciple making. So these are churches that were growing, not necessarily hugely, but they were growing, they were stable. Um, you know, so at one level, fine, but were they, were they doing anything around whole life disciple making? Were people being fruitful elsewhere? So the question becomes, what are the distinctives of the people who feel themselves to be fruitful in their everyday lives? Well, we found two things, which um, again are so obvious, they're slightly embarrassing to share, but I'm going to anyway. The first thing is we discovered that people who felt themselves to be fruitful on their front lines seem to have two things in common. One, they believed their everyday life or those contexts were important to God. Well, you would, wouldn't you? Except they believed it, not just they've been told it, they believed it. And secondly, they had some kind of prayer practice or spiritual discipline, which involved consciously reflecting on their everyday life. It could be a prayer partner, it could be journaling, it could be the prayer of examine, might be a small group that asks questions about their front line. Um, Whatever it was, it could be that when they reached that particular tree, when they were walking the dog, they always prayed for their grandchildren. It didn't matter what it was. They all had something where their everyday life, their Monday to Saturday stuff was part of their, if you like, prayer and accountability before God. Now, this is actually blindingly obvious when you think about it. Well, of course, if you start talking to God about this area of your life, chances are he'll speak back. Chances are he'll more obviously show you ways to go forward or chances are that you'll sense his partnership in it. And again, this relates to the culture. On the whole, Christians have not been encouraged to pray about the things that they do Monday to Saturday, unless they're in certain narrow criteria, direct social action and evangelism narrowly defined as having a conversation about Jesus. If you're doing those two things, you will be affirmed by the church, but the rest not necessarily. So they're not necessarily been encouraged to pray about their front lines. And very few had actually been given a range of what you might call prayer practices to experiment with, to find the one that really helped them stay focused on their front line, because we all, we all operate differently. I don't personally get on with the prayer examine, but you know, my colleague Charles just absolutely loves it. He's, he's also a spiritual director, but he absolutely loves it. Um, different people and so on. Uh, now, as you know, these are actually quite simple things to teach. But what tends to happen in whatever tradition we're in, we'll, we might teach one or two, and then people don't get the rest. So we, we, we do run a course for executives as it happens. And um, one of the things that we, we do with them is is um, we teach them the prayer of examine in, in half an hour. And then we teach them journaling in half an hour. Why it takes us to half an hour to teach them <laughs> journaling, I don't know. You buy a book and write in it. It's not very difficult, but nevertheless. And then we start to get this feedback. They, there are 36 people who come on this course every year. From two or three every year, what was the best thing about that course? Journaling or this, two or three every year. So why is this significant? Because when it comes to the drivers in the church, all we really need to do is to offer people a range of practices. And I'm sure that uh, we all know how to do that. So I leave you with those comments on, on that and uh, didn't quite get to my homily, but you've been spared that and uh, pass it back to Hugh. And to Sally. I'm here. I'm here. Thank you, Mark, so much. That's amazing. Um, 
so we're going to uh, give you an opportunity to have a think about what you've heard, reflect on what you've heard, um, inviting you to consider some questions. Um, what has struck you, struck you as particularly significant for your ministry? Other things that you are thinking about doing uh, differently in your congregations when you go back in the next month or maybe in the next uh, three months. Um, it, maybe there's a change of use of your own time that you uh, that today has inspired you to think about or a one degree shift that you might be thinking about using or someone that you particularly want to encourage um, in their ministry, be that, uh, or, you know, wherever they are on their front line. So um, I invite you to, I'm going to put you back into your um, breakout rooms. You are only going to get 15 minutes this time so that we can keep... Um, keep to time.